Hello, everyone. You all having a good CPAC so far? First of all, I want to encourage you because this is not like the CNN town hall event that they had where President Obama pre-screened the questions and you know you had to be a certain person to ask the questions. We want you all, whoever wants to come ask questions, to just come closer in. It'll be easier for our wonderful uh, ladies to come out and be able to find you. So if you can all just come closer in, that would be great. And I just want to get started. Uh, we've heard from so many speakers talking about the urgency of this election. We know that we're in a critical time, especially since we lost Antonin Scalia, our conservative legal titan. And we cannot allow Barack Obama's last moments in office to be a legacy of a third Supreme Court justice. He cannot have that opportunity, that chance. And we're not going to give it to Hillary Clinton either. Because why? Mark my words, if she's able to fill in some of these Supreme Court justice seats, we will lose our Second Amendment freedoms. And let me tell you, a Hillary Clinton Supreme Court, what they would do is that they would wipe away our fundamental individual right to self-defense. Look, I'm a mom. I'm a woman. And it's terrifying for me to even think about that. Why? Because what does President Obama and Hillary Clinton do? They want to talk about women's rights, but they don't want to talk about the most fundamental right, which is that of protecting ourselves and our own families. Can you blame us for being so angry? Especially the women out there that want to be able to bear arms? So Hillary Clinton could have the power to implement the gun control agenda that we know President Obama has been trying to shove down our throats for close to eight years. His disdain for the Second Amendment was on display during this town hall event that they had. For those who missed it, it was nothing more than a gun control infomercial where the president repeated Michael Bloomberg's talking points and lies. With our freedom on the line and so much misinformation being spread by the gun control lobby, I got to tell you, I'm so tired of the liberal media and those out there that keep spreading lies about the NRA and what they stand for. I am so tired of it. This organization who has proudly defended the Constitution, who has proudly defended the Second Amendment rights, that is why CPAC believed that it was important to do what the President didn't do. We're going to have an honest discussion on the issue. It's going to include experts from law enforcement, include individuals who are on the front lines, lawful gun owners. That's what we're going to be doing today. No pre-screened questions without follow-up, no canned responses, just an honest discussion, and a back and forth based on facts. So let's get started. It's my pleasure to introduce our amazing panel today. I have Kimberly Corbin in her sophomore year of college. She was sexually assaulted in her college area, apartment by a stranger. Kimberly made the brave decision to release her name to the media with the goal of helping even just one victim to have the courage to come forward. Kimberly went to that CNN town hall, and guess what? She confronted President Obama on his executive action <laughs> regarding gun control. And he scolded her. It was just an unreal moment in that town hall. How dare he? Kimberly aims to continue to fight for victims' rights and the ability to choose how best to defend ourselves. And then, of course, we have Milwaukee County Sheriff. Let me guess. Come on. There we go, David Clark. I mean, besides being six feet four inches, very incredibly tall, he uh, really is just an amazing voice in the law enforcement community. What an eloquent speaker. And, and he was presented last year with the Charles Heston Courage Under Fire Award, 
which this year was awarded to David Keaton. And this award CPAC gives are for individuals who stand up for their principles, even when doing so puts them at risk physically, politically, or economically. And let me tell you something, Sheriff Clark has been just a powerful voice in talking about our Second Amendment freedoms. And third, but not least, Chris Cox, who I am proud to call him and his lovely wife, Courtney, who is with us today, a dear, dear friends of ours. He has been with the NRA, although he looks like he's 21, like he's been with the NRA <laughs> for 21 years. And he is passionate about Second Amendment rights, one of the most eloquent speakers on this topic. He is executive director of the NRA Institute for Legislative Action and the chairman of the Political Victory Fund. And I'm just so honored and thrilled to be able to moderate this panel. And now let me please ask them to join me on stage. Come on out, let's clap. As a survivor of rape and now a mother to two small children, you know, it seems like being able to purchase a firearm of my choosing and being able to carry that wherever my, me and my family are, it seems like my basic responsibility as a parent at this point. I have been unspeakably victimized once already, and I refuse to let that happen again to myself or my kids. So why can't your administration see that these restrictions that you're putting to make it harder for me to own a gun or harder for me to take that where I need to be is actually just making my kids and I less safe? Kimberly now joins us. Kimberly, thank you for being with us. And, and let me first say on behalf of a lot of people, we're, it's very strong of you to tell your story. And uh, we're sorry anybody has to go through that. Thank you for being here. Were you happy with the president's answer? You know, I have to say it was kind of a non-answer, more so than anything. Um, I mm -hmm. feel like I wasn't necessarily listened to, but at the same time, he knew how he was going to respond. I didn't go into that town hall thinking that I was going to change his mind by any means, but it was more about starting a larger discussion across the country about sexual assault, victimization, and my right and everyone else's right to choose how we defend ourselves. Well, first of all, there is a rival group to the National Rifle Association. It's called the Democratic Party. <laughs> yeah. uh, and as far as President Obama and, and Mrs. Bill Clinton, they are anti-gun bigots. They are utterly intolerant to anybody else's view when it comes to, other than their own, when it comes to the Second Amendment, the shooting sports, and self-defense. But you watch, by next summer, she'll, she'll be photographed walking around in a field like she's hunting, participating in the shooting sports with a, a gun uh, uh, resting on her shoulder, probably holding it upside Michael down because she doesn't tank. know what she's doing with it anyway. Look, yeah. if you want to reduce violence, and the president knows this, you target criminals. You do not target law, otherwise law-abiding citizens, and you don't make them have to go jump through hoops in a higher threshold to exercise their Second Amendment rights. But, Sean, if he goes after the real perpetrators of violence in America, he would have to target the underclass young black male and who, who disproportionately is involved in all this violence, and he doesn't want to do that. Here's the truth about the Hollywood celebrities, political elites, and billionaires who attack the Second Amendment. The thought of average people owning firearms makes them uncomfortable. They don't like how the men and women who build their office buildings, vacation homes, and luxury cars, who mop their floors, clean their clothes, and serve their dinner, have access to the same level of protection as their armed security guards. They want you to surrender your freedom for a false promise of government-provided security they will never rely upon themselves. But no amount of money, power, or fame gives anyone the right to take our freedom away. At the core of the Second Amendment is the eternal truth that no life is more worthy of armed protection than another. That's what I believe, and that's what I fight for. I'm the National Rifle Association of America, and I'm freedom's safest place. Well, thank you all for joining us. We'll start with you, Kimberly, if you want to share with our wonderful audience your experience and what you want, would like to share with them. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's so great to see you all come out for CPAC. This is actually my first one. Um, I keep joking that I feel like the freshman that got invited to the senior prom, but <laughs> this has been amazing so far. Um, I didn't come to this uh, growing up 
in politics. I came to this in the worst way possible. In 2006, a stranger broke into my college area apartment, held me for two hours, and sexually assaulted me. I had to lay there at 20 years old thinking, <clears throat> okay, this is how I'm going to die. And it was in that moment when I was completely defenseless that I knew I was not going to let this happen to myself, my children, or anyone else if I was able. Um, I took my Second Amendment rights very seriously after that. I trained and learned uh, that concealed carry was the way that I wanted to best defend myself. It wasn't until 2013 when Colorado was trying to pass an expansive gun control package that I got up off of my couch and down into seats in front of my own senators that worked for me and told them this is how this is going to impact me. I am a survivor of rape, and I am telling you that I want my right to choose how to defend myself, and that, for me, is with a firearm. Why are you trying to legislate me into being a victim? And so from there, it kind of took off, and it's been great because sex assault and victimization should not be an issue that is owned by the left. This is a victim's right issue, and I think that, the, that we here at CPAC and the people that represent us do a fantastic job of not just saying that we're gonna protect you victims, we give you the tools to protect yourself. So this has been amazing, thank you. Well, we're so glad you're here. Thank you so much. Sheriff Clark. Thank you, thanks for being here today. Ladies and gentlemen, this document, the Constitution of the United States, means everything to me and it should mean everything to you. This is a document of freedom and liberty in the United States of America. I took an oath to defend this Constitution, and gosh darn it, I better live up to that oath. These are your rights. They are not my rights. I am a defender of your rights. Now, as it relates to the Second Amendment, it has special meaning to me, and here's why. As you know, when this country was formed, this Constitution didn't apply to the slaves. But guess what? This Constitution allowed the brilliance of the Founding Fathers, this Constitution allowed for us to eventually get it right. And we did with the 13th Amendment that freed the slaves. But the 13th Amendment only freed the slaves on paper. And many of you may know it was the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause that said this document applies to all citizens in the United States, and that included newly freed slaves. My ancestors fought as well as the Founding Fathers for this document to apply to us. Let me tell you what Frederick Douglass said about the right of self-defense. Douglass strongly supported the right of fugitive slaves to have and use weapons to resist kidnapping. When government fails to protect the just right of any individual man, that man rests on his original right of self-defense, even if it means shooting down his pursuers. Slavery is a system of brute force. It must be met with its own weapons. He went on to say, that freedom was worth fighting for. Slaves plus guns equaled freedom. The abolition of slavery was inevitably due to the arming of blacks. Now, if you think for one minute that I'm going to cede these rights back to the federal government or any government or any court, you better think again. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I will fight for your rights under this document like it were my right, and it is. And I will die fighting for this document. Thank you. Chris Cox. Thank you, Mercy. I want to thank everybody for being here today. And I want to thank CPAC for having this conversation, because it really is an important discussion. It's a discussion that's happening across the country at dinner tables, at kitchen tables, where a horrific event takes place, and people want to know what do we do? You know, what is the answer? What, what can the NRA do? What can all of us do as, as concerned Americans? But what the president would have you believe is that the only way to, to care about your kids and do something is to hate firearms, is to hate guns, is to hate this freedom. And that's not only wrong, it's divisive, uh, it's condescending, but this president 
we found out in the town hall meeting that CNN quote unquote town hall hosted where they said, NRA, you can come. We get it that you're the biggest, you know, the oldest civil rights organization in the country. You can come, you can have one pre-screen question and no rebuttal. Look, the thing I love about the National Rifle Association and our members, we're not scared of anybody. We're certainly not scared of this president. We'll have a debate with him anytime, anywhere, but we're also not stupid. We're not gonna show up at CNN and be a stage prop. So we said no. Instead, I went on Fox News and had a great discussion with Megyn Kelly on all of this. But the truth of the matter is we, we need to have a serious discussion about these issues. We need to stand with people who want to be able to defend themselves. We need to stand with our, our men and women in law enforcement. So I'm honored to be here with, with Kim and Sheriff Clark and really just look forward to having no pre-screen questions, an honest debate, and that's what we're all about. So thanks for, for participating today. Thank you, Chris. And although President Obama was invited to come, he was really scared about your questions, so uh, he was not- You heard I was gonna be here. <laughs> there was exactly, the, the sheriff is in town. So we'd love to start the question and answer period. This is really what the town hall is about. It's about the, you all, the audience, being able to ask these wonderful experts. And we'll get started with Catherine over here. And please state your name, where you're from. Uh, my name is Stephanie. Um, two quick questions. Um, I can exercise my First Amendment right anywhere. How is it that if I exercise my Second Amendment right, I can go to jail? How did we get to that place? But my second question, and I really want an answer on this, is there any kind of legislation or any thought? I can drive from New York to California with one driver's license. If I drive from New York to California, if a person accidentally crosses into a state where their carry license is not respected, they can, they can do serious time. Is, is there anything being done for a national carry? So those are my questions. Uh, thanks for the question, it's a great point. The truth of the matter is we're in Maryland today. Uh, I have a right to carry permit in Virginia. I'm not allowed to carry, I had to carry Sheriff Clark here today because I wasn't allowed to uh, carry a firearm and it wasn't easy. But the truth is that's exactly what we need to do. We need to recognize people that they, your right to defend yourself doesn't end at the state line. It didn't end when I crossed over that bridge from, from Virginia today. And we need, Congress need, it's long overdue for Congress to pass national right to carry reciprocity and allow anyone who has a legal right to carry a firearm to carry it anywhere they have a legal right to be. If I can uh, briefly add on to that, I'm tired of the Second Amendment being treated like the bastard child of the Bill of Rights. No. No. As the questioner indicated, when you cross state lines, your constitutional freedoms follow you without restriction. If you get arrested in a state you don't live in, you still have the Fifth Amendment right to counsel, right? You don't have to have a permit for that. You don't have to have a background check to have that happen. And that's why I have said no more expanded background checks, no more restrictions on your Second Amendment freedoms, and no more gun control. No, no, no. What part of no do they not understand? Next question, either side. We'll go back to Catherine. Oh, Jennifer, do you have one, Jennifer? Oh, Catherine. Hi, um, I live in Maryland, down in Worcester County, and of course in 2013, uh, our legislature passed a atrocious gun bills, and we had rallies and fought it. It didn't do any good, we're a very blue state although we, thank God, have a Republican governor now. Um, but they, whatever the Democrats didn't get in 2013, they're going for this year. They want to outlaw BBs, guns, pellet guns, antique rifles uh, will have to be registered. Uh, it will outlaw private transfers, like between fam family members. And even they want to make all college campuses gun-free and knife-free zones. Um, so, you know, we're fighting this to, as the best we can, but do you have any tips other than letters to the editor that we can use uh, to fight this? 
I would have to say, I think, first off, great question, but the tip is that your life is something that all of your legislators need to know about because your experiences are just as important as everybody else's. You need to get down in front of there, talk to your legislators, really, really take that action. And I know so many people think, well, my story doesn't matter. I was one of them. You know, it, there are typically about one in four women in this country that are going to be sexually assaulted at some time in their life. So even if it's not you, you know someone like that. And think of all of the other crimes and just experiences that we all have collectively in this room. We cannot be ignored when it comes to that. That's, that's your tip, is that you have to take action and it has to start for those that are sworn to work for you. Jennifer. Hello, my name is Cody House. I'm from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and I'm a college student at Millersville University. Uh, we recently had uh, NRA University come into a seminar to spread awareness about gun rights and the history of the Second Amendment debate uh, to college students. And uh, I know somebody personally who had a very similar situation uh, as Ms. Corbin has, and I thank you for having the courage to appear in front of us today. And uh, on campus, what we have... And what we have on campus to try to prevent those sorts of things from happening are these blue poles <laughs> with buttons on them. Every few hundred or few thousand feet on campus that if you have a problem, you can push it and the university police show up. And I'm sure as David, uh, Sheriff Clark could vouch for that, the fact that it takes time to get them there and that having a firearm carrying, uh, carrying a firearm with you allows you to have a more quicker response than the police would. Um, so my question for all of you would be, uh, well, the policy of the university is you can carry if you're, you know, 21 or older in accordance with Pennsylvania law, but only in open space. You can't carry inside the campus buildings. So if I'm in class and a crazy person comes in and starts shooting at people, I can't defend myself, my classmates, or my professors, even if my professors don't agree with my right to carry. So how <laughs> can I bring, how, how, how can we as college students uh, try to fight to make our universities, our state universities, more like in Texas, where we can conceal carry in the classroom, protect ourselves, our fellow classmates, even though they may not agree with us, and our professors that preach against the Second Amendment. Chris? I'll start off. You've already got the talking points down, so you're well on your way. So I hope you'll, uh, I hope you'll keep, I hope you'll keep uh, preaching the gospel there. The truth is, this is a part of the discussion that a lot of people find to be very uncomfortable. When you start talking about guns being introduced in school environments, the left goes crazy. Even some people on the right aren't comfortable with it. What the National Rifle Association has said is that our school kids deserve to be protected the same way our politicians and our athletes and our money are protected, and that's with armed security. What we've said is the same premise that we dealt with after 9-11 when, when terrorists attacked this country by overtaking planes after that, the, the United States Senate voted 98 to 0. They don't vote 98 to 0 on anything, but they voted 98 to 0 to allow pilots to carry firearms in the cockpit. Now, not every flight has a flight deck officer, and not every flight has an armed pilot. But that wasn't the point. The point was to send the message to bad people that if you screw around on our planes, you might be met with armed resistance. We need the same thing happening in our schools. Again, they will scream as if it's going to allow freshmen to carry firearms. You have to be 21 years old to carry it, to get a permit in this country anyway, or in these states. So this is, these are fear tactics. What we're saying is take the stickers that say no guns allowed off the windows because it's not a school security measure, and let's make sure that we put guns in the hands of the right people to keep our kids safe and to keep one another safe. You know what, what we do to you folks, and I say we, I'm talking about the government in terms of your Second Amendment freedoms is insane. Yeah, you can carry a gun on a Tuesday. If it's cloudy outside, you better have a yellow shirt on in between these hours here. And how is anybody supposed to figure this nonsense out? We do not do that with the First Amendment. We don't do it with the Fourth Amendment, unreasonable searches and seizures. We do not do it with the Fifth Amendment, only the Second. I'm gonna challenge you with this because I believe in our process and I believe in America. I think we're at a pitchfork and torches moment in America. I really do. And so I, I'd have to ask you, and I want to ask you, I want to challenge you with this. What are you willing to fight for? What are you willing to die for? 
That's a question you have to answer. I'm not going to tell you you need to do A, B, and C. You have to ask yourself that because as Judge Robert Bork said very eloquently, you know what we do in America too often? We bitch, <laughs> and then after a while we acquiesce. They can't do that to us. Next thing you know, we just kind of like lay down. That's why I said this is a pitchfork and torches moment. What are we willing to do to push back against this tyrannical government as it relates not just to the Second Amendment, but to this entire Constitution, because it is being trampled on right now? Catherine. Uh, hello, um, Dakota Workman, uh, student at West Virginia University, born and raised in West Virginia. And uh, I'd like to first off by thanking Chris and the hard work of the NRA. When I cross that line back into West Virginia, I'll be entering a constitutional carry state. And uh, my question is, is uh, as a college student, uh, what resources does the NRA have for us on campus to use to help push for things like campus carry? Yeah. You know, it's great. And I know there's some NRA university activists out there today. So I want to thank all of you for, for what you're doing. And work with us. You know, we're, we're all over the country. We, we do have a limited staff. We have about 15 people in our grassroots staff doing the work of about 500. But we're flying all over the country, meeting with young people like yourself at college campuses, letting them know what it is that they can do to get involved, what it is they can do to get engaged. And as, as Sheriff Clark said, this is, this is a challenge to all of us. We all know people. We all have uh, email lists. If you still have a fax list, you can use that one too. But it's up to us to get out and speak. It was it was fitting that Sheriff Clark received the Charlton Heston Award because Charlton Heston talked about disobedience being in our DNA. That's who we are. We need to speak out. We need to speak out for what we believe in. And there are still more of us. And as long as there are more of us who are willing to sacrifice and willing to do something, we'll continue to push this ball forward. So thank you for what you're doing. Jennifer. Uh, Kimberly from Connecticut. I think we all know what happened in Connecticut when somebody with a mental illness got a hold of a gun and attacked the school. Um, I myself am applying for my pistol permit in Connecticut, but how do we, how do, what is our argument back to people who say we can't let the mentally ill have guns and therefore we must limit the gun access? I mean, obviously we would agree, mentally ill, we don't want these sick people with guns. But, how do you, but, that, but then we say, but that encroaches on our Second Amendment rights. So how do you argue that point that the leftists make about more gun control regarding the mentally ill? I'll jump in quickly, then maybe Kim, you could share your thoughts on it. Sure. I have an article from 1968 in the American Rifleman, NRA, one of NRA's publications, calling on Congress to do something about preventing the legal access of firearms to those who are mentally uh, adjudicated as, as incompetent or danger to themselves and others. The truth is, every one of these high-profile shootings that have gotten so much media attention screams at the problem of mental health in this country. Yet, they don't want to get the mental health records into the NIC system. Uh, this, is a, this is the conversation that needs to happen that this president refuses to have. The centerpiece of President Obama's response to Newtown would not have prevented Newtown because background checks would not have prevented that horrific tragedy. And you know what? It wouldn't have prevented San Bernardino. It wouldn't have prevented San Santa Barbara or Tucson or Aurora or Fort Hood or any of these other high profile shootings. It's dishonest what the president's doing. He knows it. If he wants to talk about preventing people who shouldn't have access to firearms, welcome to the party. The National <laughs> Rifles Association has been doing that for decades, but we need to do something about mental health in this country. And unfortunately, this president's uh, been all talk, no action on that. I think one of the biggest parts that I was let down about about the town hall that I attended was that had President Obama allowed me to clarify my point instead of doing a political pivot and answering the question he wished I would have asked, it was more of a, a conversation about mental health. As a direct result of a sex assault, I was diagnosed with PTSD, with depression, with seizures related to PTSD, and how many people out there are suffering from the same ailments? Uh, domestic violence survivors, people that have experienced childhood trauma, veterans that serve our country overseas and come back with these kinds of issues. And what President Obama is saying to us is basically you get to pick one. Either you can continue to have, legally have your right to own firearms, or you can get the mental health treatment that you need, and that is unacceptable. Ladies and gentlemen, to cap this question off, 
and you know this, I'm preaching to the choir in here, but bad things happen in this world. There's evil in this world. All right, but I find it insulting to look at this mental health situation and paint this broad brush. And I'm not saying you did it. I'm just saying the way we look at this. The overwhelming majority of people who suffer from some sort of mental illness would never take a firearm and walk into a school and slaughter children. But here's an important thing, too. These are individual rights. Because somebody else goes out and misuses a firearm should not impact on my right to continue to own and possess that firearm. These are individual rights. We punish those individuals, not people in the United States. We don't punish people who haven't been directly involved in things. And that's what this gun control stuff does. It punishes law-abiding people. Catherine. No? There it is. Hey, my name is Alex Bookman. I go to Hillsdale College. Um, and oh, thank you. <laughs> it's a, we're, we're very blessed to go there. It's an incredible college. Um, in talking points outside of Hillsdale, just with friends, I'm from Colorado, so with friends back in Colorado, yes, uh, great state. Welcome. Uh, we'll talk about, uh, you know, where, what's the limit of the Second Amendment in terms of what sort of arms can you carry? And a lot of people will shoot back at me immediately that Ronald Reagan uh, proposed an assault weapons ban. So we kind of get this conflicting par where, like, I'm a, I love Ronald Reagan, I want to support him. Then he also has that aspect to him. I was wondering, where is that balance at between, you know, the strength of a firearm that you can carry and personal safety, and then how do you counter that point back to them? Chris. Sure. We've tried it. We banned some autos in this country for a decade, not for a year, not for 18 months, for a decade. Uh, Congress mandated a study be included as part of that ban. And it came back and said that a total of 3% of crimes are committed with rifles of all kinds. Not just the scary looking ones, but all rifles. And what they found is it had no impact on crime. And the reason it had no impact on crime, one is because criminals aren't walking around with rifles by and large. And two, criminals by definition, as Sheriff Clark pointed out, break the law. So the only people who were abiding by it were law abiding people. And criminals continue to do what they do, which is not pay attention to the law. And to suggest that somehow these rifles are somehow different or fire differently from a, any other semi-automatics that have been around for over 100 years is simply scare tactics by the media and by our opponents. So is there a balance? Of course there's a balance in everything. You know, people say, well, NRA believes that, you know, you should be able to drive a tank down the street. Maybe I'd like to, but I can't. I'm not <laughs> saying, that I, saying that it would be a good idea, but the truth is we need to have a serious discussion about addressing the underlying problems a serious discussion on mental health reform, a serious discussion on school security, and a serious discussion on prosecuting these, these maggots in Chicago and these other cities who are out preying on innocent people. And to suggest that somehow telling me that you, know, you can't have a magazine with more than seven or eight rounds is gonna do something about a gang problem in Chicago is, is asinine, and to suggest that it's gonna do something to prevent mental health problems in this country is equally asinine. So we wanna address the underlying problems. Our opponents just want more restrictions that ultimately don't work. And that's the problem, as Sheriff Clark pointed out, the fallacy of gun control is that somehow there's one more law Look, we've tried to legislate evil out of people's hearts throughout mankind, throughout the history of the world. If we could do it, we would, and all of us would support it. But it doesn't exist, and that's why gun control has failed throughout history and continues to fail in this country. One of the other things that we have to get better at doing, and I said we, we all need to get better at it, we allow the left to control the narrative in this discussion. All right? A firearm is a tool. That's all it is. It's like a baseball player that uses a bat. That's a tool, right? We need to get this conversation focused on the behavior. We don't have a gun control problem in America. We have a crime control problem yes. in America. And if you think about it, more people are killed in car crashes per year more people are killed by drunk drivers per year than are killed by firearms. Yet I don't hear anybody proposing car control legislation. Because the car is the tool. 
It's the behavior of the drunk driver. It's the behavior of the reckless driver. And as a society, we all kind of agree on that, but all of a sudden, we get to the gun and it's a problem with the gun. No, it is a problem with the behavior. So if we get better at controlling the narrative and keeping this focus on behavior, like with mental health, behavior, and not the gun, I think we're going to come out uh, uh, better ahead than we are now in, in one of these arguments. And there are over, there are over 20,000 gun laws on the books already. Federal prosecution of those laws under President Obama is down almost 40 percent. Almost 40 percent. So if he's not going to prosecute the ones that are already on the books, what leads anyone to believe that he's going to prosecute the next one? Unfortunately, that's what we're dealing with with this president. And it's, a, it's such a dishonest approach to addressing serious problems in this country. And hopefully the next president will do a much better job. Jennifer. Hi, my name is Stephen. Uh, I study at the University of Pittsburgh. And uh, with West Virginia, uh, just recently joining Vermont as the only states in the country that have constitutional carry, do you see any negatives or downsides to constitutional carry as opposed to uh, traditional concealed carry permits? Well, we've, we've actually passed constitutional carry in a number of states across the country. It's not just limited to uh, those two. But the truth of the matter is, when we started working on permit carry in this country, the left screamed bloody murder, that it was going to be Wild West shootouts, that every fender bender was going to result in someone getting shot. And what we found is the exact opposite that law-abiding people carrying firearms are a harm to no one because by definition they're law-abiding. Uh, they were keeping records in Florida on revocations, people who had their licenses revoked in Florida, and it was 0.007%. They basically stopped keeping records because it happened so infrequently. So is there a, is there a problem, Sheriff Clark can answer this, and certainly, uh, God bless Kim, she can answer it. Is there a problem with good law-abiding people carrying firearms to defend themselves? Absolutely not. That shouldn't be anybody's focus, shouldn't be anybody's problem. We should actually work to make it easier for those things to happen. And that's where the president refuses to, to accept that there is actually such a, the, such a thing as a good girl with a gun or a good guy with a gun. Everything he talks about is the negative, the criminal misuse of firearms. No question about it. There are criminals who misuse firearms and we need to hammer them. But you don't, the flip side of that is you have to at the same time make it easier for people who want to be able to defend themselves and their families. And that's a, a side of this debate that the president refuses to engage in. Well, it's nice because our society is finally coming around to this point where, you know, it's not victim blaming anymore. We need to teach our men not to rape and really understanding what rape culture means. But then you come to guns and they're so quick, instead of blaming the victim, you blame the gun. It's a tool, just like Sheriff Clark said. It is a tool. Why aren't we placing more value on who is holding that gun? And why aren't we placing more value on human life? Jennifer, well, oh, Catherine, go ahead. Millie got us all distracted over there. <laughs> I'm Bill Hudgens from Greensboro, North Carolina. I also serve as a volunteer for our Sheriff's Office. In recent months, we've been encouraged that when we finish our duties, that we remove our uniform shirts and replace them with a civilian shirts for fear of someone attacking. My question is, what can we do to prevent criminals and gang members from acquiring firearms? Sheriff Clark, you consider the man in uniform? Sure. We need better effort at the prosecution uh, level as it relates to we, we We can arrest people until the cows come home, and we do. All right, for crimes of violence, illegal possession of firearms. But if you can't get it to a prosecutor to issue the charge, or if in some watered-down plea agreement, or it gets to the court and the judge is light on the sentence, it doesn't matter how many people we arrest. If we want to send, and the criminals know this, if we want to send a message to the criminal element about how serious we are about the illegal possession of a firearm or the illegal use of that firearm to rape, to rob, then they're going to continue to do it. So I believe that if, the, if we were on the same page or, or if the prosecutors and judges were on the same page that we are in law enforcement, it would send a different message to the criminal element. You know what? 
they'd get it after a while. They would get it. But right now, they know it's worth the risk. So when you ask, what can we do to prevent, we have to have tougher prosecutions. Chris talked about We've got enough gun laws on the books. We don't use them. Can I just add, the, the other thing we do, need to do is elect a president who has a basic level of respect for law enforcement yes. in this country. Yes. yes. This, this is the only president in American history who's turned his back on law enforcement like this, Republican or Democrat. There's not a president in American history who has done what this president's done, which is teach people and, and make it acceptable for kids to be suspicious of law enforcement. Who are our kids supposed to look up to if they can't look up to cops in this country? This is an outrage. So one of the things we need to do is elect a president who has a basic level of common sense when it comes to law enforcement. Jennifer. Hi, my name is Kyle Kostuk. I'm from New Berlin, Wisconsin, just a county over from Sheriff Clark. Good to see you, Sheriff. Um, I'd like to say thanks for the panel for being here today and answering our questions. And my question kind of bounces off the question from Hillsdale College and also what you've been talking about, about gun laws on the books. Because some of those gun laws on the books are bad laws and they're unconstitutional. Mainly, I'm thinking the NFA laws. You look at things like short barrel rifles, suppressors, they're like never used in crime at all and they have benefits for people who would be able to own them, except they're heavily restricted. What is the NRA doing right now, as well as what can we do as citizens to kind of push the repeal of those laws? Sure, we've been working across the country on the issue of class three in general. I don't wanna get into too many specifics here, but one of the few things that Europeans do better than us is the use of suppressors. Uh, they use suppressors hunting all over Europe, one, to be good neighbors, and two, to protect their hearing. But what you hear out of Hollywood and what you see in, in uh, pop culture is that somehow these are silencers, which anyone who knows about them, they're not silent. Uh, again, it's, they're, they're not movie quality. Uh, but this is an area where, again, there's a lot of work to be done. We're making, we're making progress, but part of this is an education campaign, first and foremost with Washington, D.C. If these folks don't understand the difference between a semi-automatic and a fully automatic, and they're trying to ban semi-automatics, trying to engage them in a conversation on SBRs or, or suppressors is that much more challenging. But I can assure you, we're committed to, to making common sense re repeals and reforms, not just in this area, but across the board. Where there are restrictions between a law-abiding person and exercising this freedom, we're there, whether it's in the courtroom or whether it's in the legislature, trying to, trying to remove and repeal those restrictions. That's what we do every day, and I can promise you that's gonna continue. Catherine. You know, you know what we're doing is, What's happening is we're being let down by our political class. Mm. I've heard that a lot throughout this conference. A lot of these things that you're talking about, sir, are happening in the state houses and they're happening on Capitol Hill with these restrictions. Okay, that's the importance of being involved in the electoral process, to get people in there who get it and who will remember it once they get there about what this is about. This is about we the people. This is about freedom and liberty. And one of the other things you can do, and he's not paying me to say this, by the way. <laughs> For those of you who don't belong, join the NRA, and here's why. They're paid with those dues to fight and watch full time to protect our gun rights. They're full time, because you all are busy and you don't have time to do it. They're in the state houses fighting this stuff. They're on Capitol Hill. That's what we pay them for, and I just upped my membership. I'm now a patron member. I think that's the highest one you can be, right? Because <laughs> I put my money where my mouth is, but I expect my money to go toward the thing that you're talking about, sir, and that's to get into these state houses. I've seen Chris and Madison. I've seen them on Capitol Hill. We've got to bend this curve back in favor of the American people. Catherine. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Jim Morris. I'm a, I'm a taxpayer. Um, I, 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 do, I do a lot of volunteer work in Baltimore City, uh, repairing houses in really destitute neighborhoods. And one of the neighborhoods that we did work in was burned out last year. Um, uh, when you talk to the people who live there, there's an overwhelming number of uh, single moms with two or three kids. That uh, when the kids go to school in the morning, they're watching carefully. When they come home, they're always there to make sure the kids get home safely. And when it gets dark, um, they batten down the hatches. They lock themselves in behind barred doors. You know this, uh, the inner city culture. Um, so I was talking to one of these moms one time, and she said, the problem is 
they have guns and we don't. Mm. And so as a thought experiment, friends of ours were talking, what would happen if the NRA or some organization actually gave moms and middle-aged and elderly people in the inner city guns and NRA training and actually put guns in every one of these houses? As a sheriff, you've seen the dynamic of how the criminals do these breaking and entering because they know the weak houses in the neighborhood. What would happen if all those people were armed in a city like Milwaukee or like Baltimore? I'll, I'll start off and then maybe, well, they would arrest me and throw me under the jail. I'm 100% <laughs> certain of that. But the truth is our, our job at the National Rifle Association, and you'll never, you'll never hear one of us saying, go buy a gun. That's not what, that's not what we do. What we say is that we're going to fight for your right to own one. If you want to own one, we'll teach you how to do it safely and responsibly. If you want to learn how to use it proficiently and carry it, we'll teach you how to do that as well. And if you don't want to own a gun, that's fine too. That's the beauty of freedom. That's the beauty of that document that Sheriff Clark holds up. So uh, our, we're not in the business of, of giving guns away. It's not, it's not our job. Our job is to protect your God-given right to defend yourself. And it just happens to be that firearms are the most effective means of doing that. And we do it without hesitation. We do it without apology. Uh, but certainly, where they've experimented in this little thing called freedom, it's always, it's always won. And where they've experimented in restricting that freedom, you look at it in Chicago, you look at it in Baltimore, you look at it in histories across, across, or in countries across the world and throughout history, it's been a failed experiment. And it's time to, it's time to move on and recognize that we do have this this God-given right, this human innate right to defend ourselves, and if whether it's a woman's right to choose a firearm to defend themselves or a guy's right to, to defend our, our wives and our families, that's what we're going to do, and that's what the National Rifle Association is going to continue to fight for. This is kind of interesting. You know who pays the highest price for gun control? It's the people this gentleman was just talking about, right. the poor who can't afford $1,000 for a background check, who can't afford $200 for a carry concealed yeah. license in some of these states, these onerous laws that maybe you and I can afford, they pay the highest price. The ones that President Obama claims he's trying to protect, he's hurting the most. All right, so we gotta take a look at this, and this gun control uh, thing too, and here's, a, here's an effective way, I think, of beating back the left's narrative. You know, you're Mr. Mrs. Gun Control Freak. Your rules, restrictions pay the highest price on poor people who can't afford a $500 gun. Or when they have that one firearm and it's taken away because it was used in a self-defense and it was lawfully used that the police won't give it back. I can go out and buy a new gun. I have several guns. I, that's not a burden to me. But it's a burden to the household that has one gun. Somebody came and broke in. They defended their family and now the cops. And the cops have to take it away for evidence. But the cops should, as soon as possible, return that firearm back to that owner because that owner can't afford to go out and spend another $500. This, I think, would be an effective narrative uh, toward this, this gun control crowd that you're, you're the, the people you claim to support are the ones you're hurting the most. There are more gates around, there are more bars on windows than gates around communities in this yes. country. Yes, Kimberly, did you wanna ask? Yeah, my kiddos are one and two years old and as a mother, I'd have to say that that is my right, that is what I want to choose because hell hath no fury than someone like me where if somebody's breaking in and coming after my children, it is not going to happen and I think it would be great if those who want to carry actually get those guns in their hands. We're gonna be wrapping this up here shortly because we're running out of time. I'm gonna have to talk to the chairman of ACU and tell him that next time we need about a couple more hours to do this. <laughs> uh, so what I'd like to do is just take one more question, get some quick answers, and then we'll close it off with each of you saying some words. Hi, my name is Hope Lewis, and I'm from the King's College in New York City. Thankfully, our college is um, very strong on conservative values. However, um, they are welcome and they open anybody with opposing views. And my roommate personally, she's been struggling a lot and I've been having long conversations with her as we've been continuing learning in CPAC that the way that we transform culture is from face-to-face -face conversations. 
However, one of the conversations that we've had recently was that she doesn't see how it's a God-given right for us to kill somebody else. She thinks that we should never, ever have the chance to pull the trigger on somebody and end their life when they could receive grace. So my question proposed is, what is the balance between justice and grace? Kimberly, do you want to? That is, a, that is a fantastic question, and I think that's what most of us grapple with. What I'm asking for is my right to defend myself because nobody is giving that other person that's pointing a gun at me that right to choose. I don't think there's, this is not a, a zero sum game with your question, justice and grace. I think the two things are compatible. And I, I'm, I'm okay with somebody who has the views of the person that you were talking to, okay? I'm, I'm okay with a, a differing viewpoint than mine. I just say, I don't want your misguided views to impact on me. Right. So you could think that if you want, but it shouldn't impact on me. And this is not a new conversation. This is not a new struggle. Uh, people have had this conversation uh, throughout history. Uh, Cicero said, there exists a law not written anywhere, but in our hearts that says that if you're under attack, any and every means possible to defend yourself is morally right. Morally right. It is morally right for you to defend yourself if someone's trying to hurt you. I want to thank you all for your questions. What I'd like to do is give each of you 30 seconds to wrap up last thoughts on this wonderful uh, town hall that we're having so far. Kimberly. Well, thank you guys so much for having us. I think that, honestly, the power going forward is in all of your hands. It's our jobs to speak up and to fight daily to protect our rights. I'm very, very happy to say I am the NRA, and these are the people that go to fight for us each day, and I highly suggest that you all do the same. Sure. Thank you for being here today. Like I said, the challenge to you, this is a pitchfork and torches moment. What are you willing to fight for? What are you willing to die for? Keep fighting. Yes. Well, I want to thank all of you for being here on a Saturday. I want to thank CPAC and Mercy for hosting this event. I want to thank Kim for your courage and your bravery and your being willing to tell this story. I want to thank Sheriff Clark for your friendship and for your service to our country and the Constitution. And really just encourage all of you to understand when you leave here, be resolved to take this message to your friends and your coworkers. Be resolved to get this message out in your communities that the Second Amendment and these constitutional freedoms are on the ballot in November, and they are very much at risk. These freedoms are under attack. This is part of a broader culture war, and what we do between now and Election Day is gonna determine the type of country our kids and grandkids live in, and it's gonna be up to us to do it. It's not, a, it's not an opportunity, it's a responsibility, but I hope you had a great conference, and I hope you'll uh, leave here inspired to make a difference. Thank, Thank you. you so much. All right.